Uh, Professor Bauer is, is the chair of physics and astronomy at Michigan State University in East Lansing, uh, Michigan. Uh, he got his bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees uh, in physics from the University of Giessen in Germany in 1981, 85, and 87, respectively. Uh, and he served as the Department of uh, he served the Department of Physics and Astronomy in, at Michigan State in various capacities. And has held various administrative positions, including chairperson of the Department of Physics and Astronomy and head of the, the, the theory group at the National Superconducting Cyclotron Lab and director of the Institute for Cyber-Enabled Research at Michigan State. Uh, he's won numerous awards uh, and honors, including an NSF Presidential Faculty Fellow Award, and he's a fellow of the American Physical Society. He's a renowned physicist and has widely served on scientific advisory committees all over the world. Okay, Professor Bauer. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm acutely aware that I'm the only thing standing between you and this. So uh, I'll try to finish by 1 o'clock so that we can have lunch and then go. Um, much of what I wanted to say actually was uh, uh, preempted by Professor Sani in his very first talk. So I've been busy cutting slides from my presentation and then adding others to fill back. Uh, but, but this, uh, so what I'm trying to do is uh, I'll try to uh, contrast where conventional computing is right now, what we're doing for example in my institute, um, and then where quantum computing uh, can compete as not as a, a, a toy model in a sandbox, but as a, a future general process co a computer. And uh, that is going to be a hard order. So why do we need computing at all? And, and so I tried to make this sketch of complexity in many body systems. So as the number of constituents goes from, well, two is the smallest. One is kind of pointless. So from two to infinity, uh, the, the few body systems are easily solvable with analytic methods and you know you get things like wave functions like this and, and in the large n limit you usually can neglect quantum mechanics at all and you get thermal kind of descriptions that follow Boltzmann type distributions. Uh, where the fun is is in these mesoscopic systems in between uh, where computers become essential. They're, you know we can use analytic guidance but in the end we need to use computers. So I'll give you a very abbreviated history of physics as an example. So I have a timeline here. And in the 19, I mean in the 1700s, uh, Newton invented calculus to descri describe mechanics. I say this as a German, uh, and there's, you know, Leibniz did it at the same time, but for mathematics reasons. So I think the valid reason was to invent calculus uh, to describe mechanics. Uh, then experimental, uh, heydays were in the 1800s, in the mid-19th century, where Faraday et al. studied electricity and magnetism. Um, uh, I, I think then I can credit the German uh, part of physics properly. Uh, in, in the early 1900s, in the early 20th century, uh, Max Planck became the first uh, theoretical physicist, and he became a theoretical physicist because he, he was locked out of the experimental lab by von Helmholtz. Um, and then Planck and Einstein and so on explored the quantum world and in the end of the 20th and the 21st century computational physics uh, emerged as a third branch of physics. Uh, I believe that's von Neumann there with one of those early difference engines. So uh, there's this thing called Moore's law that has driven uh, computer development over the last 40 years. Initially Moore said 18 months but but now Moore's law has been corrected to, to say computer speed doubles every two years. If you look it up in Wikipedia, that's what it says now, but initially it was 18 months. Uh, data storage, on the other hand, doubles every 12 months, and network speed doubles every nine months. The, the physics limits in this are not reached for another decade, uh, or more perhaps. So here's evidence for Moore's law. Is there a, I guess it helps to point the right side at the, Screen. So you, you see this is a, a doubly logarithmic plot, date of introduction here is 1971, 2008, and then uh, number of transistors in a, in a, a CPU is uh, a couple of thousand here, a couple of billion here, but a couple of billion that's really cheating because these are all eight core units. And, and so that's how Moore's law has been continued for the last five years. If you look at the, the CPU chips, the clock frequency hasn't actually risen anymore. It's for the last five years it has been two and a half to three 
gigahertz and that's it. So all the gains come from putting more cores into the same setup. And, and then eventually you run into the limit of heat. Uh, and for large installations, that's, that's actually a limiting factor already. Right now we're paying about half the in, uh, of the total investment cost in a, in a large computer system is just in the air conditioning, not in, in the computing hardware. Uh, here's the PC storage capacity. It doubles also every two years. Uh, so over the last 30 years, we had 13 doubling cycles. Um, and uh, this is actually helped by new advances in physics. Uh, now any hard drive that you find in any computer uses uh, principles of giant magneto resistance, which were only discovered, what, 15 years ago, received the Nobel Prize two years ago. So here are the largest computers in, in their speed records uh, from 1993 on to, well, I just downloaded it. This is the November 2009 list. You can find these at top500.org. And uh, so, so the red graphs is the, the top performer on Earth. And the purple graph is the slowest machine in the top 500. So that's sort of the, the threshold that you need to get into the top 500. So the top machine on Earth that crossed the teraflop boundary in 1997 was ASCII red and then ASCII white. And then at least the US community received a big shock when the Earth simulator uh, took the lead, the, the Japanese machine, uh, in, what is it, 2002. Uh, and there was a huge investment in the US and then Blue Jean took the title, and then there were a whole bunch of other machines that I have on the next slide. But the main point is that, uh, you know, we're uh, in 1997, we crossed the teraflop, 10 to the 12 operations per second. In 2009, we crossed the petaflop, 10 to the 15 operations per second. And, uh, you know, what would have been your world record machine uh, here, uh, is now not even making it in the top 500 anymore by a long margin. So the top 10 computers in the world right now is, in terms of floating point operations are the Jaguar. It's a Cray machine at Oak Ridge. It runs at, uh, I think, 2.4 petaflops. And then the previous uh, world record holder was Roadrunner in Los Alamos. It's an IBM installation uh, and so on. You can see uh, there's a German installation here at number four, number five. Uh, is in China now. So. Um, Japan is not on this uh, scale anymore. So uh, I want to highlight a few developments uh, in the history of, of these computers. Uh, first, that they're driven by demand from the physical sciences and, and by invention in the physical sciences. So in 1946, the largest computer in the world looked like this. It was ENIAC at MIT. and. Uh, it was all tube driven uh, and, and you know, hand cabled as you can see. And it was filling this lecture hall. That's the kind of size that we were talking about. And uh, people had definite ideas where computing could go from there. So this was electric component, electronic components that superseded the mechanical components, for example, of the difference engine. And that was the state of art in 1946. Now, in 1947, if you would have asked me to give a, what, what Vidal said is a vision talk, I, I would have said, well, you know, this is the state of the art. And Moore's law actually held for these puppies too, just uh, uh, you know, on a much smaller scale. And you could have extrapolated how computing will go, and you will have more and more tubes, and you will have more and more cables, and a bit larger and larger rooms, and probably this is going to be the end of computing. And then came along this little thing. Uh, so this was an invention at Bell Labs. It's the transistor. Bardeen and collaborators got the Nobel Prize for it. It was 1947, just a little over 50 years ago. Uh, and uh, in 2000, the, uh, a threshold was crossed that there were 100 million transistors in each PC sh chip. I said in the last slide there were 2 billion in a PC chip now, but it's cheating because there's eight cores. So the, the, the real figure of merit is something like 100 million. So over 50 years, there was a factor of 100 million advance. Now, uh, this was the best picture I could find of a large computer. Uh, this is Blue Jean, it was taken in 2004. This is racks and racks and racks and rows and rows of racks and racks of computers, uh, Blue Jean. And so the question is, 
can a little thing like this, a quantum computer that's in its infancy, do the same to, the, to this as the transistor did to this. So that's what we need to keep an open mind for. Um, but, but let me just give you a first qualifier already. I think the CPU is actually, uh, is actually not that important. The, the network is what's much more important. So let me talk about that. Well, as I said, it's more important than the CPU. This was the first sketch of, that I could find of somebody envisioning that one could network computers together. And it was the ARPANET uh, uh, driven by the Defense Department. It was December 1969. It was four nodes. It was UCLA, UC Santa Barbara, SRI. Oh, yeah, Utah. Yeah. So, so that was the first vision of something which we now call the Internet in 1969. So the, the whole thing became very, very useful in 1989, 20 years later, uh, when the World Wide Web was invented by uh, Berners-Lee at CERN. And this is actually the machine that he did it on. Um, and in 1994, it, it, it all moved into the consumer domain uh, with uh, the, the writing of the code for Netscape, uh, which was uh, an old University of Illinois product, Mosaic, but written by the same person, Mark Andreessen, basically. Um, and then, uh, you know, it seems like Google has been around forever, but it was only founded in 1998 by uh, Larry Page and Sergey Brin two graduate students at the time at Stanford. So that's only 1998. And you see the invention cycles get shorter and shorter. Here it's 20 years, and then it's five years, and then it's four years. And the last thing that I'm, I'm going to put up there, what do you think should be the last thing that's going in this empty spot here? What's the new biggest thing that's even more important in Google? This. The iPhone. And, and you know, Seems like everybody has one of these now, right? This is, this is a cheater's iPhone. It's only an iPod, but it does almost the same thing, except I can't make phone calls. Uh, and, and it's the first truly portable computer and that was given into the hands of the masses, in, in particular developers. There's over a million apps right now that you can download onto your iPhone. Uh, and it was only invented in 2007, which seems like amazing. So, so the invention cycles get shorter and shorter, and I will actually come back to this idea of these shorter and shorter cycles in the end of my talk. So um, what do we use computers for? So what could quantum computing be useful for? I would guess, and, and you know, it's really risky to make these predictions, but anything on this page, quantum computing will never be useful for. Okay? So you could laugh at me like, just at like the Thomas Watson quote that I, I will use later again 20 years from now. And if you laugh at me 20 years from now, that would be great because that means quantum computing has been a success. And in addition, I am famous because nobody laughs at the mistakes of not famous people. So I'm going to say it here. Quantum computing will not be used of any of this where we spend most of our time, you know, email, doing research, searching the web, uh, spreadsheets, word processing, graphs, all that quantum computing will never have a use. I'm choosing my words carefully here. So, so some of us do actual programming, just like this. You know, this is a Java applet. Uh, and then there's advanced programming packages like Mathematica, Mat Maple, MathLab, that can actually be used for, for real research. For example, proving the Kepler conjecture, which could not be done by hand previously. Data collection. Uh, their quantum computers may be useful, actually. Um, not so much. Uh, visualization. Visualization is already taken care of uh, with in incredible uh, uh, abundance. And you can see just some of these things that just pretty picture. This is an in interesting example because that's uh, uh, research from one of my colleagues who works in, in uh, the STAR collaboration at the Rel Relativistic Heavy Ion Collider. And these people analyze in real time uh, these events that consists of every one of these lines that you see is a track that a particle left, up to 10,000 particles. And now with the LHC switching on, this is going to be even uh, a much bigger scale. So um, what do computers do? They enable science. So there's three high-tech buzzwords. Um, bio, of course, is, is very nano and info. And I would say 
that uh, the progress in bio and, and, and all biosciences relies on the advances in, in the nanosciences and both are dependent on, on information sciences. So uh, what we're doing at MSU is uh, we have a high performance computing center which works completely uh, in a classical way. So we have uh, three main setups uh, and, and they're uh, basically commodity Linux cluster of maybe a thousand cores. Um, uh, then we have um, uh, FAP nodes that, that, that are 32 or 64 uh, cores that sit on the same large memories, let's say 512 gigabyte. Um, and we just bought these, so I haven't included them yet. And then also something that we just bought is a graphics processor cluster, uh, which is also a new paradigm in computing that has nothing to do with uh, quantum computing, but that uses the graphics processes that drive every screen in, for example, every PlayStation. And it turns out, just for the problem that you addressed of protein folding, these graphics processors are about 20 times faster than the conventional CPUs. They're very uh, limited instruction set uh, processor, but they're great for certain scientific uh, applications. But I still would not call them a general process computer. So, uh, What's next for us is uh, uh, we also want to have a slice of the world record. So uh, we formed the Great Lakes Consortium on Petascale Computing. And uh, these are all the members. And interestingly enough, there's also even a couple of high schools in this consortium. And you can draw your own conclusions from this. And we have the Blue Waters machine, which will go online probably in 2010, but maybe only in 2011, and we, which will be the most powerful supercomputer on Earth. So what can you do with uh, that kind of co computational power? This is, for example, simulations that are done on the Earth simulator. So this is only uh, one-tenth of a petaflop. Uh, and they're done by, uh, by my colleague David Tomanik at, at MSU. And it's just some um, uh, ab initio calculations of molecular forces uh, that uh, have uh, a buckyball inside a bucky tube as a molecular switch, and here the merging of two buckyballs into a bot bucky peanut. Um, so that kind of stuff can already be done, uh, and we don't need additional computational power for that. Here's computational nuclear physics. I'm a nuclear physicist by training, so uh, the simulations on this page are, are mine. Uh, and the questions that we're addressing is, how are the heaviest elements made in the universe? What's the equation of state of nuclear matter? We have a new experimental facility that will be built now and that the Department of Energy is investing 500 million into. And the computational tools produce output like this, where we can understand uh, sub-nano, you know, micro-nano quantum system, nuclear collisions. We don't need quantum computation for that. Uh, we can simulate the quantum wave functions with uh, semi-classical methods on conventional computers, and that works just fine. Computational astrophysics. Um, so astrophysics uh, doesn't have the luxury of doing. Here's a simulation that Ed Brown has done for surface waves on the surface of a neutron star. This is work uh, of my graduate student, Terence Strother, um, and follows the isotope composition in a supernova explosion. Um, the, the next uh, highlight that I want to give you is computational biochemistry. So this is uh, two of our faculty members. As part of their startup package, they got a, one of the top 500 computers in the world uh, at the time, at 200 gigaflops. Now that doesn't make anybody's list anymore. But it was just basically a couple of closets full of blades like this. And as I said, more than half of the total expense went actually into air conditioning this room. And uh, so one. Um, one problem that I want to highlight is, uh, is in the realm of protein folding, where you have to make, just like Professor Kack said uh, in the previous talk, three-dimensional structures out of a one-dimensional coding sequence, which is a non-trivial problem. What they do is they use constrained molecular dynamics calculations. So one example is uh, in the cholera protein. Um, and there is uh, this part of the protein acts like a piston to push out the cholera toxin. And these calculations that they do can actually predict the structure uh, and the active sites, it's here. 
And um, so in the calculation you predict, you knock out this residue and you neutralize the poison. So, so that type of calculation informs uh, experimental biochemistry on where to attack problems that are real problems in disease control. Uh, here's a really interesting problem that as a theorist I like a lot. A and it's from chemistry and it's Piotr Pietzog at MSU who did this. And here's a, um, a very, very simple uh, molecule, imine peroxide, which con consists of a hydrogen, a nitrogen and two oxygens. And uh, you know, experiments in chemistry were performed uh, in 1998, two different experiments came up with uh, vastly different answers for different observables for different coefficients uh, in the energy function. And, um, and then the question is, here's one experiment, here's the other. They don't, dis they don't agree at all with each other. And these guys performed four sets of calculations based on these coupled cluster met uh, ab initio methods, uh, which have turned out to be extremely predictive. And, as a result of this, I, I just highlight one observable here, this v, the, the oxygen, oxygen stretch mode. You can clearly see that all calculations agreed with one experiment and disagreed with the other. And so, uh, you know, on the basis of computational chemistry, it was decided that one experiment is falsified and the other is verified, which is just a total paradigm shift in science because usually you did the other way around, right? You made two calculations, they disagreed, then you did the experiment to find out who's right. Now we can do calculations that decide which experiment is right. It's, it's a paradigm shift. The next thing I want to highlight is digital evolution. Um, so for the longest time, for the last 20 years, uh, my colleague Richard Lenski has done very interesting experiments uh, in microbiology with E. coli bacteria, where he uh, grew these E. coli bacteria in petri dishes and uh, they, they multiply about every 20 minutes. So you get a new generation every 20 minutes. And then you can change some conditions for the E. coli bacteria. Let's say you change the sugar content or you add some anthrax or whatever, you know. Uh, and, and then you wait and see what mutates out of that. And every few hundred generations, he froze one generation away so that he had the ancestry. And then when there was an evolutionary trait emergent, he could go back and see how that uh, originated. So he has on the order of 40,000 generations frozen away now. Uh, and, and then they tried the same idea uh, with computer viruses. It's, instead of having biological bacteria, they use computer viruses that are the same kind of computer viruses that infest your hard drive and then you have to erase everything. Well, they infest hard drives on purpose for computers that are only uh, made for this. And, uh, and then they let them compete for space. And in some visualization, different colors means a different virus. You change the boundary conditions, you let them uh, change their code by themselves and then replicate. And then whoever is the fittest wins. Now this is called digital evolution. Uh, and it's many orders of magnitude faster than watching E. coli bacteria grow and divide. These digital organisms solve real computational problems. And so, again, this is, has nothing to do with quantum computing, but, but just like the graphics processes that I talked about earlier, it's a totally different paradigm as compared to conventional general purpose computing. Um, what I predict is that these digital organisms will, for example, aid in drug discovery. Uh, so we've, we've uh, I'm, I'm one of the senior scientists on this proposal. We proposed this beacon, uh, NSF Science and Technology Center, Eric Goodman is the principal. Uh, next, well, two months from now, we will hear uh, if our proposal was successful. All that we know so far is that we're among 11 finalists for six science and technology centers. Uh, you can also compute with the internet as a whole. Uh, and so SETI is a good example. Uh, SETI at home started, uh, the at-home boom, there are many at-homes now, but SETI stands for Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, and you can download a screensaver, and while your PC is not working for you, you're taking a break, your PC works for these guys. Um, typically, what they get uh, as, a, as a sustained rate, it's something like 60 teraflops per second. Without having to spend any uh, money on machines, 
which is uh, you know, something like 1,000 CPU years on a conventional computer per day, just by harvesting the wasted cycle of computers worldwide. <coughs> so let me uh, give you uh, an example from particle physics. Uh, a few days ago, really, the Large Hadron Collider at CERN produced its first particle collisions that are now the world record in, in uh, collision energy, and it took that record away from uh, the Fermi National Lab. So this is an aerial photo of uh, Geneva. These are the Swiss Alps in the background, and superimposed is where the Large Hadron Collider is. It's uh, 100 meters underground, so you can't see it, but that's where it is. It's Lake Geneva there in the in the picture. So uh, let me just give you one example, the Atlas detector. The Michigan State Group is a very active participant in this detector. Um, there is no person built for scale, but it's about the height of this little shoe there. That's what, what one human being looks like in compared, comparison to this detector. So this detector at full luminosity of, of the LHC, which is nowhere near right now, but which will be reached maybe next year, maybe the year after next year, it will produce a lot of data. Um, so it, it will produce collisions at the rate of 40 million per second. So it has a 40, million, 40 megahertz uh, duty cycle. That will produce 40 terabyte per second of raw data that have to be pro processed. So every, every second, 40 data, a terabyte come out of this machine. And, and level one, they have special hardware trigger that reduced this to from 40 megahertz to 75 kilohertz. So they throw basically 998 out of a million events, uh, out of a thousand events away and keep two events that they have predetermined <coughs> that are good. That gives you only six, uh, 75 gigabyte per second. Then they have embedded processes in the detector which reduce this data to 5,000 so a factor of 25 and 5 gigabyte per second. And then they have a, a dedicated PC farm really all across the world uh, that reduces this to 100 hertz or 100 megabyte per second. And then this data storage and offline analysis is done uh, by their, their tier two and three partners and, uh, and it will produce something like 10 petabyte per year. So if you assume that uh, PC that you buy now, the upper end has one terabyte or so of a hard drive, that would fill 10,000 of those per year. So um, here's for uh, several uh, uh, particle physics and nuclear physics experiments, the event size and the event rate and uh, the, uh, the yellow ones are current ones and the white ones are future ones. Um, and I put blue circles around the ones that MSU uh, participates in. So Alice, for example, has by far the largest event sizes, which is uh, a de detector at the LHC designed for, for nucleus nucleus collisions. So each one of their events has uh, several hundred thousand uh, bytes. Uh, I already said that uh, uh, CERN plans to digest all this data worldwide. This is actually an old picture from 2004 and I couldn't find a new one over the last few days anymore. CERN computing is great but not great with their visuals. Uh, so they have tier one centers in I think by now uh, 15 countries around the world and each country that has a tier one center, the tier one center for the US sits at Fermilab here. Uh, then has tier two centers distributed all across the country and this is an old picture. I wanted to show that MSU and University of Michigan have a shared tier two center also, but this is too old. We didn't have one then. And then it goes to tier three facilities which are usually not even drawn in except a few uh, to any of the partners. Uh, while I have your attention, let me also uh, uh, talk about computers in teaching. That's something that should be considered here too. So uh, a core business of any university, I would say, is the creation, application, and dissemination of knowledge. And in the context of this conference, I would just uh, delete the word knowledge and replace it by information, which really is all there is, right? Information, creation, application, dissemination. So um, information technology, I hope, 
I have convinced you has changed the way that knowledge and information is created in the physical sciences and it will do the same in the way that uh, information is delivered uh, to students in the 21st century. So um, virtual university uh, models are creeping up everywhere. Probably the most prominent one is the University of Phoenix right now, which is in the United States, the university with the largest enrollment of all universities and university systems. And it was created uh, by a history professor who, in his mid-50s who was just dissatisfied with how his students had to always go to his class instead of accessing them uh, whenever he wanted. He's a billionaire now. Um, and uh, since the internet, I hope I've convinced you earlier, will have essentially infinite bandwidths, we have to rethink on how we deliver lectures. Like up there, there's a camera filming me right now. You don't have to sit in this lecture hall to get the benefit of what I'm saying. You can just go to the internet. Uh, it, but it has to be more, it has to be adaptive, uh, immersive, and it has to be customized to the needs of the students, which is not what this camera does. This camera just films me and that's it. So learning environments have to be customized for the students. Uh, and, and then the brick and mortar advantages of having a place where students go will go away. And uh, you know, you, you could say, well, okay, one of the points of going to the university is socializing. Well, when I gave this talk first, maybe three years ago, I, I did say that still. Now I'm not saying that anymore because I watch my children, how they socialize on Facebook. They are having 15 conversations going at the same time. They don't need to be in the same room anymore to talk to other people. It, the way that you interact in social settings has changed in ways that I have to say I don't understand anymore. So. So in any case, what, what one cannot afford to do is to outsource this uh, information technology management to external commercial entities. And uh, if the camera was not rolling, I would talk about Blackboard right now, but I'm not doing that. Uh, fortunately, there is uh, many approaches, uh, and of course I'm only gonna highlight our own. It's called Lon Kappa. Um, it's uh, content sharing across the net. Uh, it's customized content delivery for individual students uh, and uh, it, it has a seamless internationalization. So uh, th there's actually, if you see the world map, the countries with red, in red have multiple installations, in, in yellow they have single installations. There is even one in India. Um, and you know, you can just pull down a menu, you set your language to Hindu and from then on the system uh, delivers everything to you in that language. Uh, Portuguese is one, for example, Hebrew is one. Uh, Chinese is one. Um, so this is all based on a Linux uh, platform. It uses Apache web servers. Everything is in GNU public license. So participation in this is completely free. You just download a tarball, you install it on your local server, and then you're part of the network. You can use everybody else's resources, and if you want, everybody else can use your resources. Initially, we had set this up as an e-commerce platform where you could buy in and, and charge uh, money for resources. But it turns out that people are just incredibly willing to give up, give away their best stuff for free just for the pleasure of other people using it. So we have a library of more than 100,000 reusable resources. With resources I mean a web page or a movie, an applet, a graphic, a homework assignment. So um, quantum computing, I'm coming to predictions here. So uh, predictions are hard. So uh, Niels Bohr said, prediction is very difficult, especially about the future. Um, and, and I already mentioned that quote. It's maybe a misquote. It's not so clear that Thomas Watson Sr. actually said this, but it's just too juicy to let this go. So uh, he was the IBM president, and in 1943, he's reported to say, have said, I think there is a world market for maybe five computers total. So it's still useful. Uh, here's a quote that I like a lot it's by Victor Weisskopf. He said, predictions are like Austrian train schedules. Austrian trains are always late, so why do the Austrians bother to print train schedules? Well, how else would they know by how much their trains are late? So here's some of my predictions. I, I, I would uh, surmise that Moore's Law will continue for at least another two decades. Why I cut this off in two decades will become clear in three slides from now. Um, 
network bandwidths will become uh, infinitesimally cheap uh, and eventually, also in about two decades, saturate the entire human input bandwidths. So in about two decades, we will be able to generate virtual environments that you can enter into and you cannot detect with any of your senses anymore that you're dealing with a virtual environment instead of reality. Uh, there's a couple of cautions. Uh, Nathan Merville, the, the vice president for future technologies at, at uh, Microsoft at the time, he's not anymore, he, he founded his own company. He said software is a gas. That means software fills all the available space. The more uh, CPU power, the more memory you give it, software will always find uh, a way to fill all of that. An indication of that is how long it takes for your computer to switch on, right? If you had computers 20 years ago, it took about one or two minutes to switch them on. It still takes the same time. Uh, and, and the reason why that is, is designers of software put more and more and more features into your hands and there is a trade-off in more features versus, you know, taxing the patience of the user and for the last 20 years that balance hasn't changed. So your computers become infinitely more powerful but the waiting is still the same and still as frustrating. Uh, caution number two is with all that growth in what the machines can do, the growth in content will only be linear, not exponential, because in the end we still have to provide that content. So what does that have to do with quantum computing? Um, so here's a, um, a quantum computer that uh, our colleague Mike, Mark Dickman at uh, MSU proposed and it, it's, well, it's just a proposal. It's, there's no practical implementation yet, but it's a very elegant one. Uh, that uses electrons on the surface of uh, liquid helium. Now, uh, so, so here's the, the basic promise of quantum computation. In compu uh, conventional computers, you have n processors that can process n instructions simultaneously in some kind of time interval. Now, a quantum computer, on the other hand, with n processors, can process two to the nth instructions simultaneously. And so if you, you have 16 processors, it's not so great. Two to the 16 is 16, 65,000, so what? But if you double the number of processors to 32, then you get four plus billion information units processed per time unit. So that's the great, um, the great promise. Now, undoubtedly, the, the mathematics is beautiful. There are lots of concepts that were already developed in the early days of quantum mechanics in the earliest 20th, 20th century. Uh, the key ingredient is entanglement. That's what makes a quantum computer quantum instead of classical. Everything else is just window dressing. You have to establish a many body wave function. Uh, and there's uh, some surprising al applications in a few algorithms, mainly database search and integer factorization. Um, I had some slides here, I took them all out. Professor Vishal Sani just g gave a perfect introduction, which I wish would have been four hours long in just a, instead of just the one hour that he used. But everything that you needed to know about quantum computing was in there already. But where is the experimental manifestation for large N? He didn't cover that. So let me uh, address a few systems. Uh, some of the candidates that have been proposed are, as I said, electrons on liquid helium, trapped ions. That's uh, um, a graphics from and, and real data from the Vienna group. Uh, where they have eight ions trapped that can be individually read out by lasers. Uh, superconducting circuits or squids, uh, they're not exactly the same, uh, but uh, they both live off, off on really cold temperatures, so I wrote them in the same line. Optical lattices, M my colleague Carlo Piermarocchi is working on something that I didn't talk about here, but I think has uh, great potential, NMR, which currently still holds the world record for the number of uh, entangled qubits. Uh, there's BEC based, diamond based, cavity QED, uh, a, a large number of experiments. Uh, one that I think is particularly elegant came out this year uh, from the Yale Waterloo uh, Vienna collaboration. It was in Nature earlier this year. And uh, it has two qubits that are entangled uh, via microwaves. And um, this figure proves that you can have entanglement on demand and that you have an experimentation, experimental implementation of Grover's database algorithm. 
so, so there are first, uh, well, approaches in their infancy, just like the transistor was at, in 1947-48. But the big question is, can we really extrapolate this? So this error correction that Professor Kack talked in the last uh, talk is one of them. Another one is uh, really resolving structure. And so I, I tried to sketch this here. Uh, so can a, can a general purpose, yes, you can have individual, uh, you know, tailor-made tasks projecting a one-body uh, wave function out. That's not a problem. But if you really want to have the process of quantum computing, this two to the n enhancement, you have to really construct a totally entangled n-body wave function. So uh, I'm writing this like this where the number of qubits are listed here and it's a, it's a product wave function. I'm not even writing a Slater determinant. It doesn't have to be fermions, but it has to be entangled. It has to be a quantum mechanical wave function. And then you conduct some kind of measurement with this wave function. And when you do that, you get some observable. And uh, so I, I, I plotted this observable in a one-dimensional scale. And for concreteness, let's say it's energy, which is probably what you will want in any case. So you can, you can have a many-body wave function that, that is the entangled wave function of all these individual qubits. And if you want to do two to the n computations at the same time, you have to be able to proje project one state out. That's this red line out of the many, many, many that have some kind of observable uh, in this space. Now, energy is probably the most convenient and there will be a lower and there will be an upper bound. I mean, there wouldn't have to be an upper bound, but if there's no upper bound, you cannot perform a measurement. So for, for all things that you can measure, you have to have a bounded spectrum. And in this spectrum, you cannot have any degeneracy because if you have degeneracy, then you don't get single-valued functions out and then your measurements will not re, uh, yield a result that's unambiguous, which is also not acceptable, at least not for general purpose computing. So uh, you must fit two to the n discrete values, different values into a narrow band, uh, well, into a finite band. It doesn't have to be that narrow. But as n gets big, everything is narrow. And then you have the, what I call the Q factor problem. So, so the quality of an oscillator is, uh, you can write as the energy divided by the absolute value of, of the energy uncertainty. And, uh, you know, as n goes to very large, uh, you know, for, for, uh, for n equals 32, I wrote earlier, you get uh, already uh, four plus billion values. You have to fit four plus billion values into this energy band. And then delta E has to be the difference between the upper and lower boundary divided by that four plus billion. Okay, so delta E gets really, really small. And we simply have no physical way of making any physical system with that kind of quality factor. So that, for general, for, for general purpose computing, that type of challenge is still far away from being solved. And only then can this promise of quantum computing really be borne out fully. So we're still far away from that. That's bad news and good news. If it was easy, then people would already be doing it. That's the bad news. The good news is there's really good work that one can still do and have a huge impact. Um, in the last two minutes of my talk, I, I, I want to address this uh, cycle of ever faster innovation that goes on uh, in a more broad spectrum. It's uh, one name for it is the Kurzweil singularity. Um, so uh, what I plot here as an example is evolution of life on Earth. Okay. And uh, so this is in million years. So here's four and a half billion years before current time Earth was formed. Um, and then it's not so clear when life developed, but somewhere in this plus minus one billion year time interval. And then the first uh, useful processes were photosynthesis. And then it goes on and it goes closer and closer. Animals only come into play about 500 million years ago. Uh, land plants only about 400 million years ago. By the way, all fossil fuels that, that are presently exploited were made in a 100 million year band between the invention when, when uh, evolution invented plants with woodsy stems and, and then evolution went ahead 
and invented bacteria that can eat that wood. In the 100 million years between those two uh, time points, all the wood fell down and was accumulated and then made into fossil fuels after the plants died. And you see then it goes faster and faster. And by the time that humans arrive on this scale, you can't even see that anymore. It's so fine grained. So again, uh, evolution uh, inventions, so to say, progress in evolution went on faster and faster time scale as you go later and later. And um, so, so what you can do is you can plot the time difference between significant events. And you tell me what you call a significant event, and then I can compute the time difference. Uh, in the past versus the time when it ex uh, um, existed, when the, when the event occurred. So, so here's the time difference is a billion years and it occurred maybe three and a half billion years ago. And here the time difference is only maybe 50 million years, but it only occurred 30, 40 million years ago. So uh, this is such a list of events. You can have any list that you want and many people have compiled these lists. On our next slide, I show you many of them. Um, and the, the result is pretty universal. You get a power law. And this is called the Kurzweil singularity. So here's a slide from Kurzweil. There's his newest book, uh, The Singularity is Near, so I have done enough to plug his stuff. Ray Kurzweil, by the way, is the inventor of the uh, synthesizer. And he has worked extensively uh, uh, aiding deaf people uh, with his inventions. And he's also a futurist who thinks about these things. And uh, so, um, I guess in this book by Modis, th there was a compilation of, of other people's uh, compilations of significant events, and th there's a whole bunch of them. And what Kurzweil did is he just plotted them in the way that I just addressed, and you, you can really see that there is a power law, and uh, you know the time difference between significant inventions is between, or, or events is between 10 and the minimum now, 30 years, and you see it crosses here in, in about 10 years or so. so um, no matter what significant event you have. Earlier I had the network, right? How did it evolve from the first DARPA scaling to the iPhone? And invention goes faster and faster. So that would also fit on here, except it would only fit in the last few uh, in this corner. No matter what you do, this Kurzweil singularity will be reached. What Kurzweil thinks, what I may or may not agree with, is that at the singularity, machines will actually become self-aware and uh, will then have intelligence that far outstrips our own. If quantum computing can contribute to that or if quantum computing will be obsolete before that arises, well, that's the big question. And I thank you for your attention.